Welcome, everybody, to a Simons Observatory update live from the University of Pennsylvania in their high bay lab where they're assembling and testing the large aperture telescope receiver. I am with Shule Tzu, and he's going to give us a tour and an update of what's going on there. Hello, Chule. Hi, Stuart. Thank you for the interview. So uh, my name is Chule Xu. I, uh, I work with the University of Pennsylvania team, FASO, uh, led by Professor Mark Devlin. So uh, behind me is our high bay, which houses the, the, the large aperture telescope receiver. I will take you in later. Uh, the reason I'm doing this outside was because we have five compressors running, so it's really loud there. So it might not be a best place to do an interview. First, tell, tell me, tell us a little bit about what it's like working there uh, with COVID. What are your procedures and processes? What are the challenges? Oh, talking about this, probably since we, we, we finished the starting point, I should put on my uh, uh, mask. I think, I think you're socially distanced. You don't need to wear it for, I don't think I can, I can get any, any aerosol. Yeah. Over the, over but that's, that's, that's how much serious, how serious we treat this uh, procedure. So um, I think starting in June, we went into this uh, two shift kind of schedule. Basically one team, which is a shift, goes in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then another shift goes in Thursday and also Tuesday. So in this way, we can kind of maintain like a 50% productivity. And then starting this week, uh, we went into this phase two, which means everyone technically can come in any time uh, if needed, which is really important for the LATR because sometimes one shift of person power was just not enough. You will see when you see this instrument, you can see every single plate is hundreds of pounds. It needs some, literally needs some people to lift it. One or two is not enough. We need several. So this is really helping a lot. So how do you, how do you organize that? Do you, do you have a procedure for scheduling each day? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, we have done this multiple times. So we we definitely know how to do this uh, uh, smoothly these days already. We started this, I think, almost one year from now on, uh, uh, one year ago, and then after several cycles, we know kind of very well how do we do this. In the same time, as you mentioned, uh, we do have, uh, I actually maintain a schedule of the testing. So because of the, the turnaround for this testing is really long. So we want to plan it well. And also we, we want to uh, make sure every single test we do, we have all the information we need. We don't want to say, oh, we come back. We say, oh, wow, I really wish we did that. And at that time, that's a month going into the schedule, given this many people, given the facility. In terms of dollars, there will be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, uh, so that's why we keep a strict schedule and make sure at the, every single stage we test as many things as we can think of, record the details so we can revisit. So we're, uh, roughly, what's the overall schedule for assembly so and the, testing and where are you at in that? So the overall schedule is uh, if, we, if we skip the design part, once the, when the thing was delivered, it was 2019 July. And then we basically, we started this kind of almost like monthly cycle. Uh, we had, including this, nine cool down cycles already. Uh, you can imagine if we didn't lose the three months from the COVID-19, we would do will be 12. So we are really on this month to month cycle. And then, uh, so, so we, we did this incrementally because this scale of a receiver, nobody has ever built it. So there are a lot of kind of things can go wrong. We don't want to kind of integrate everything in and then we turn it on. Like nothing works. We don't, we don't know even where to diagnose. So we really start uh, simple and then add things up step by step. At e, how, at long does it, does it, how long does it take you for a pump, uh, a pump out and cool down? Uh, pump out and cool down. We just started pumping out, I think, a week from last monday so right now we are cooling we started cooling on friday so you can see around like pumping takes around like five days and then cool down all the way to the uh 100 millikelvin above absolute zero kelvin uh takes about uh i think we can turn on the final stage dilution refrigerator in a day or two so probably another 
So it's like five plus five. But this is an exceptionally large volume to uh, large, get to that. Serious. I will show you uh, later. Yeah. High vacuum. Just uh, so, so just r really briefly for those of us who uh, may not be uh, familiar that are joining us from from the interested public or your uh, interested colleagues, uh, what is the purpose of the large aperture telescope? And it, it contrasts that with the small aperture telescope that's being assembled and tested at UC San Diego. So uh, the small aperture telescope, they are actually, although they are both detecting CMB, they are actually they actually have kind of slightly different scientific goals. Small aperture telescope, uh, actually, because it's small aperture, it has a bigger footprint on the sky. So it was actually going after the big pattern of the sky, trying to detect the the the, the so-called polarization B mode which will uh, inform us what exactly happened at the very, very beginning of the universe. So that's what small aperture telescope is mainly focusing on. The large aperture telescope is more like a traditional telescope, we understand. It's, it's a large aperture, so it's, it's, the, the, it's, its footprint, it's, we call it the resolution on the sky, is really, really small. So we can see very fine structures on the sky, which will be like a gas clusters, which is the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. We will be finding all these things, and we will be seeing all the lensing effect uh, from the cosmic macro background. And all these other things can be used to probe the universe, not only the history of the universe, but also the evolution of the galaxies, and also galaxy clusters, and also... The, the history of the realization is like a suite of science that with a combination of the large aperture telescope and also small aperture telescope can bring up to the community. With that, would you like to bring us inside and, and give us a, a look-see at where you're at and a status report? Like, a, like an instrument. We are going to the instrument, right? Yeah, so here, if you can look, here is the high bay at the University of Pennsylvania. Here it is. So I will take you inside to look at where actually, uh, as I just mentioned, where actually we closed up. So you cannot see the inside of the crest, but you can see how it looks like during testing. Nice. I'm scanning my card so we can get in. Here it is. Here is the receiver. If I put you here. A, it's a very impressive size. Yeah, that's how big it is. I will do another one here. So this is the front of it. And then you have it here. That's how big it is. <laughs> so, so you can see if I climb on the ladder. So this is basically what it looks like. And then the 13 uh, windows, we have two open for this task. Eventually, they will all be windows with the uh, thousands of detectors behind them. And then, uh, and then uh, if you look on the top, uh, we have all the cooler. This is Ningfeng, a grad student working with us. Uh, Ningfeng was actually the main contributor who, uh, who designed the entire thing. Good to so, see you. Uh, uh, so and then if you look on the top, there were, two, there were a lot of things going on there. So there were a positive cooler, and also uh, there is a dilution refrigerator. You probably saw a lot in the SAT. We also have one, but it's really high up there. So if you look on the ground, this probably looks familiar. Refrigerator. This is a thermal pump station. Uh, the SAT, so my small aperture telescope could also have one. So what really is different for the our ATR is uh, look at all these uh, equipment. We have uh, this is two compressor. There are another two and another two. So we have five compressors running continuously right now to cool the thing. And also these are the thermometer readout devices provided by Yale. 
so you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are the because this is so big, we need so many sensors to uh, to to make sure we know what's going on inside of it. Just the uh, the hose and the cable management is is impressive. There, yeah, you right. a, col you can, you can, a kilometer can, of yeah, hoses. This this is only for the thermometers. Eventually, we'll have detectors. Sixty thousand detectors are coming out. That will be a big hassle. That's what we spend a lot of time and also money on. So, what's the test you're conducting now? Oh, the testing we are conducting now is is is, is kind of a series, right? So, uh, so right now what we are doing is the major thing is so each of these windows behind it there will be a optics tube which contains the the some optics lenses filters and also eventually the detectors. So last time we put in the first up skew, we saw some uh, vibration problems, which might cause the final stage to heat up. So this is one of the tricky things, which is kind of hard to understand. If we don't think about this all the time. So, so to cool things down to this level of temperature, like 100 millikelvin, if you have a paper clip shaking a little bit, as a as a as a as a tuning fork, that 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 dynamic energy transforms into heat can heat up the one millikelvin shape. That's the the um, the amount of energy we need to uh, eliminate. That's probably why that's that's we suspect that's something we saw during the last run. So for this run, we put in some mechanism try to down try to damp this vibration. Uh, the excitation and see whether we can cool the thing even lower. Even with that, we still cool things lower than what we are required, but we thought we could do better. So this, this test, we are basically running. And also uh, another important test for this run is, um, so for these, all these cold optics to put in, to cool all the way down to say four Kelvin, which is more than 200 Celsius below zero, so normally materials cannot tolerate that. They will either crack or become too brittle or it will shrink or it will just it will just shatter. So we tested something already for the previous round. This round we went even more aggressively to double check and test all the code optics we can put in. So uh, to make sure basically to give, to give the green light for the follow up production because you can see there will be 13 of those. So we are basically developing the prototype, which after we verify it works, we can give the go ahead to basically mass production, which is really important for the whole entire uh, schedule for us. So this milestone that you're going to hit uh, will tell you uh, the tolerances that you need to know, and if there's any adjustments, and then what will be the the the, the next milestone. Oh, the next milestone will be even more exciting. So, I just mentioned that the optics tube eventually will will host the detectors, right? We, right now, we don't have the detectors. Our readout detector group is working so hard to try to provide us, which is on schedule to deliver to be delivered to us in three weeks. When we will we will finish this test and open up. So eventually, the next milestone will be have all the detectors and also the read out the entire chain uh, implemented on the cross set and then read it out. Because so the, detect the, uh, the detectors you're waiting for are the, are the wafers, correct? And Yeah, and, wafers. Uh, oh, the first step will be a single pixel box or something like that. Can, so that's the, the, the test that the milestone that we just reached at University of California, San Diego was the installation yeah, that's, yeah. of, this, the of, of their is, single is doing this already. pixel box. Uh, they are they are they are they are on different wave they are on wafers they are past the different for this each op tube has three for SAT there are seven I <laughs> you think that's different so when during the development stage uh, we are trying to make sure everything between SAT and LAT be uniform as uniform as possible so we can borrow the if say we have a spare on the site we can borrow the the, the, the spare equipment across. So it's more of the configuration of the right, detectors right. that's different. And so that'll be really exciting because uh, 
even though they are the same detectors, but how we implement that? What is the mechanical environment? What is the planetary environment will be like? Will it affect the detector performance? Noise level, which eventually matters for the scientific output a lot. So that's why, uh, that's why it will be a super cool milestone. I think we're on schedule to have the delivery in, uh, in three or four weeks when we are open and put them in, and then we will see. So well, that's exciting. Thing, when, wanna... when, when you get those, we'll have, another, uh, we'll have another update from you. That'll be exciting when you get to install those. Yeah, that'll be great. So, uh, so and the, you, you said, because you, you mentioned because we have so many sensors, basically, for, we call it housekeeping, basically, to make sure that the, the car set is healthy. So, so, you see, if you look at this, this is one of the three out four. Here's another one. On the top, there is another one. For the LATR, we have five of those. You, Nick probably told you about this. This is also something me and Nick works together to make sure this thing is unified. Uh, uni we call it universal readout harness, URH, across LAT and also SAT. But SAT, one telescope needs one of them. We have five. So you sent me some photos of the, of the uh, uh, cryostat opened up. So maybe I can share those on my screen. You can talk a little bit about uh, some of the photos. There, there's a picture in yeah. front of the cryostat open. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah, this is actually me taking a photo. There are very few uh, photos with me inside because normally I take the photo. So on my right in this picture is an op tube ready to be installed. So you can see it, it's facing down. So what is on the top, but it's blocked by the metal shell is where the detectors are supposed to be. And then behind my back in the picture is actually the open up back of the cryostat, which is not this, not, not this one, not the one we are looking at, it's the back. When we open up the back, we can ex get access to this uh, dilution refrigerator everything. So you can see that the shiny thing kind of sticking up uh, right behind me is actually the dilution refrigerator. It's the power, it, it, it is actually the power house that really cool things down to 100 millikelvin. And is it the these, is it the identical to the to the one in the sat, or is it, uh, a, is it? No, the sat one is a little bit smaller, but very smaller. similar from the same company, Blue Force. Right, Blue Force. So, so then from from the Blue Force, you've got a bigger Blue Force, and you've got a bunch of thermal um, engineering going on there to, to yeah, yeah, wick away the heat. Yeah, it's thermal Yeah. So that's where the detectors are going to live, right in that. Yeah. Uh, so this kind of a uh, hexagon thing we call it thermal bus. It's, you, can, you can treat it as a as a as a as a heat highway, a cooling power highway. We use that to distribute the cooling power from the from the dilution refrigerator to the door of the detectors. That's a great way of describing it. Yeah. Uh, so it's like otherwise, otherwise the traffic will be huge, and then there will be kind of some kind of delay or some kind of thermal gradient, which will not cool the detectors to the amount we want it. So this is another close-up shot. I think this is some of the uh, uh, thermometry. Yeah, handling. that's one of the thermometry pictures. Yes. Each of them. And, and there's a close-up of your uh, uh, of your heat highway. Right, right, right. This is actually connecting the, the, the highway hexagon structure to the Blue Force dilution refrigerator wow. coat is the plate. So a lot so of this, the faults the, the on the went into this. The thermal bus, it's, it's deceptive, but the materials, well, you can talk a little bit about the materials and some of the thinking that went into this. Yeah, it's, it's copper. Basically, co copper is the best con heat conductor we can find. And then... Um, and then it's and also the thickness, the structure, the copper is also very heavy, <laughs> right? So we have to balance between how heavy we can be, how can how effective can this basically highway to to deliver the cooling power to each of the destinations. But it's very pure copper, right? It's a, it's ninety nine point very very pure, pure copper. Mm -hmm. The the technical it's, term is called oxygen free high conductivity copper. OFHC. 
It's not it's not yeah. the kind you get at uh, at, at Best Buy. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's another I'm shot, there's, trick, but probably not. That's not where where we went. <laughs> there, there's another shot of it, just for uh, folks to see another angle. This is actually a, a very great shot. So it's actually a. Uh, so in this picture, uh, on the clo closest to us on the right is actually one of the, you can see one of the mm, antennas going out to meet with a structure in the optic tube, which is connected to the detectors. You can see the detectors are in the optic tube. So it actually has a mechanism to receive this cooling power out, which is the further kind of thing sticking out in the back. So this kind of thermal bus provides a heat effective but mechanical kind of compliance joint so that they can be connected together. The easiest thing you imagine would be just, just fold them together. But these are kind of two kind of uh, things. It's really hard to control them uh, to be mating together seamlessly. So this thing here is, is, is called, we call it thermal bus, which is a very Con heat conductive material, a structure, but connects these things together uh, with this kind of uh, flexibility in terms of mechanical uh, frame. Got a couple more here. There's a, a ribbon cable, which I think is uh, mostly thermometry uh, yeah. connectors, right? Right. Yeah. And these you can are actually, see uh, how many different sensors you're, you've got going to right. monitor the, uh, right. the, the cryogenics. This is actually the, something I soldered in the, in the previous picture. <laughs> and that took a lot of work, I'm sure, to, to, to uh, shield that, uh, the back oh, of this Oh, definitely. Thing. That's actually the step that, 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 made it, that made us suffer the most because we don't have enough people. You can see putting this size of plate back on with only three people is really challenging. Normally, we had five. So... And there's, uh, there, I think that's readout. Is that readout? Uh, yeah, this is actually something. Uh, so you can see, this is something I came up with and followed up by a uh, grad student, which is Jack. So routing these kind of semi-rigid coaxial cables from, from a surface distribute, distributed on a two-meter diameter and not interfering each other out to like five five cores on the outside of the cross that is a really challenging task. So first, we need to route them well. Second, when, when they are routed already, we, we, we still want to have the freedom to take one up tube out and also put it in without having to redo all the cable, removing everything at all. So this is something I came up with. Uh, basically, the idea is, this is the highway street kind of uh, concept, which is well adopted uh, cross collaboration I came up with, which is once the coaxial cable comes out, we send it directly to the closest uh, outer shell as soon as possible. We've got a couple of more <laughs> shots here. There's a uh, there's again your thermal uh, a thermal bus. Uh, maybe that's a different angle of it. And yeah. There's a shot right. inside, which shows a bit of the complexity of the. Uh, thermometry cabling and the exactly, readout coaxes right. that you just showed us. Um, so people can see there's a lot going on inside of that cryostat. And it's an impressive amount of work that it takes to uh, connect all this. And I wanted to, to just end, end my screen share on this shot. Yeah, this is actually, uh, so we mentioned earlier, because we were worried uh, things would go wrong, like uh, oh, I see. dramatically. So this is actually... Uh, I think it was one, it was, it was the fourth or fifth time. Oh, was it? Okay, I see. Because before we got there, we were trying to do this different staging kind of milestone. So first to make sure everything holds together, and then to make sure we can cool down to four Kelvin instead of all the way to this final goal. Make sure we understand everything at four Kelvin, and then we start adding more things in. This, is, this happened when we first added the dilution refrigerator in. Uh, and then cool all the way down to, uh, to less than 15 millikelvin. So one thing we are very proud of is, so uh, everything went kind of smoothly since it was delivered. So we did not uh, experience too much hiccups. So it just went, it's like a bang, bang, bang. It goes step by step. So that's why uh, 
only after one year, this 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 the, the validation for the entire crash that as big as as complex as it is, it's almost done. The operating temperature is fifty millikelvin. Ideally, it will be as long as the the requirement is uh, is one hundred less than one hundred millikelvin. So last time we did eighty, and then we think we can do much better. This time our goal is fifty. We will see. Well, I, that was a really great tour. Uh, we we really appreciate that. Is there is there anything else you want to tell us about uh, what you're doing now? What's coming up and about your your so uh, another thing? Um, I didn't show here. This is a little table. We got a lot of help from UCSD, especially Matt. Uh, this is a little little table. We we basically test the uh, radio frequency response. This is the detector of. Uh, the detector, the, the readout uh, RF chain, we tested with it. Uh, we tested several rounds already. For this round, we will test it again to make sure the entire chain is working before we put the, the detectors in for the next one. You're next also one. using uh, the same type of configuration with the squids, correct, and getting it to Yes, it's that, exactly the same thing, but different implementation. Uh, but because, because it's a different environment, mechanical and the cryogenical, and also because because the size of this, you can, I talked about the highway street. So some of the lines can be five meters long. Whether this long kind of cable run with this high frequency RF signal going inside it will be a problem or not. So that's why we really need to test this uh, thoroughly yeah, if, before we deploy. If, if people want to go more to that's 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 the multiplexing design, so you can. Yeah, that's it's, how you it's get very so, cool, so many detectors. Yeah. Because out of how, how many detectors again in the in the uh, in the LAT? So each of this hexagon thing you look takes about like six thousand. So we have thirteen. So it's um it's a seven seventy thousand or something. Yeah. So that's uh that's really like you said earlier. Nothing like this has ever been done before yeah, with that that is. many detectors, uh, that density of detectors. And then reading yeah, yeah. out that many detectors is is, a, is an incredible challenge that right. uh, has has been worked on for many years to get to this point. Thanks so much, Chile. Uh, we really no appreciate problem. your time, and look forward to talking to you again in a couple of months when you get those detectors and they're ready to install them and see how that goes. And yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. an incredible team effort. And uh, congratulations on on this current uh, milestone. And the test going so well and getting back into business uh, in your phase two COVID recovery. Thank you so much. Please let me know if there's anything else we can provide.